All right, solar. Solar is definitely not a gimmick. It is not a feel good, oh, I'm just doing things for the environment. I, it's kind of useless, but it makes me feel good. No, solar is real. It's tangible. It gives actually real benefits. It might be environmentally conscious, but that's not the only thing that's good about it. It's an absolute real way to convert the sun's energy as a means to recharge your batteries. It's here, it's not a dream, it's, uh, we see it, right? And it's possible on a boat. I'm trying to show some examples with solar panels, which we do two kind of real popular ways. There's also in parallel, although I rarely recommend in parallel, single solar panel, solar panel in series, and we got a controller. The controller is essential. I get this question all the time. Jeff, they're like, oh, do I need a controller? I'm just gonna connect my solar panels to my batteries. Well, first of all, Solar panels rarely, if ever, give output voltage that your battery needs. There's no such thing as a 12 volt solar panel. Some solar panels are 18 volts. Some solar panels are five volts. Some solar panels are, I've got, we put arrays in that are almost 100 volts. You're taking 100 volts DC. You need to convert, regulate this power and you go through a controller to give what the batteries need because your batteries might be full. Like on my boat, for example, in the summer months, I could be connected to shore power and I have six controllers that are each connected to a solar panel and those controllers have to say, you know what, I don't need to work. The batteries are full. So they'll disconnect the solar panels from the battery because the batteries aren't being discharged because I'm not using the boat. People that connect a solar panel directly to a battery are the same boaters that are complaining that their batteries are being cooked and their batteries don't last. You can't, like you need a gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is the controller. Okay, and we'll talk about, we'll dial in a little bit into the implications of all this. So when you're gonna be purchasing solar panels, you're gonna have a big choice. The first one that you're gonna make is, am I gonna go with mono or poly? And realistically, what it comes down to um, is that a mono panel is more efficient than a poly panel. What does that mean? It means that if you have a solar panel that is, let's call it four feet by two feet, that panel, let's say, well, let's make it easier. Yeah, four feet, it's generally it's about 48 inches by 26 inches. So let's call it four feet by two feet. That panel might be 100 watts if it was poly, but if it's mono, it's 125 watts. So generally, you get about a 20%, 25% increase in wattage for a known dimension. So two panels, exactly the same, same size. One panel is gonna be about 25% more power output for the same size. So what is, why is that important? Well, first is that the one that has less output, guess what, is actually the less expensive one. So it's the best value. So that's one reason. The mono, higher efficiency, is more expensive. Okay, well that makes sense, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about one or the other. And when we tackle boats, <clears throat> and I've got a boater that's got a large surface area, huge surface area, right? Maybe it's a power boater with a huge bimini, and they need, le they need way less solar panels than they have space, meaning that I could do an array for 1,000 watts and they only need 500, because we've done the math and we'll talk about the math, I'm gonna recommend most likely that we'll go with poly. It's sort of like when you're in the country, you built a rancher, when you're downtown, you build a high rise, right? Energy de density is what is gonna maybe make the decision for you on your boat. On my boat, I have a sailboat that's from the 1990s that has a very narrow transom, right? My transom doesn't have a beam that is crazy like modern sailboats. Therefore, the canvas on top of my boat is limited. So when I made a choice to get solar panels, I had limited space. Therefore, if I wanted more solar panels or I wanted as much solar panels as I could fit on my small limited canvas, I went with mono panels, right? Because the, I just didn't have a lot of surface area to, to spread. So mono and poly, that's pretty much the big difference. There's other differences, but definitely best value is with a poly panel. 
The goal is ultimately with solar is to be here longer. By the way, that's uh, Preto, Desolation Sound. Anybody who hasn't been there yet, version of heaven right here, 100 nautical miles maybe from here. So that's Preto, right? So <clears throat> basically, why would we do about, let's say last year we did probably about 100 solar arrays. So when co people come to us and say, Jeff, how do I go about choosing a solar array? I want solar for my boat, but I don't know where to start. What should I do? The most common things that we end up doing is I've got a boat on a buoy at Salt Spring on an island, and I want to keep it topped off just to meet demand, just to make sure, because I can't plug in, and I just want to keep my batteries topped off. I want a charger to recharge my batteries, but not a lot, just to keep them on float. That's reason number one. Reason number two, Jeff, I remember the days when I didn't have refrigeration on my boat or when I boated without refrigeration. And without refrigeration, my, do my demands are very minimal. I just want a solar array that's going to offset refrigeration. If I can offset refrigeration, I'm good. That's probably the number one most popular thing. Close to that is an owner that says, or boater that says, Jeff, I want to be able to stay another day in anchor. I'm currently staying one day, I, but I'd like to be able to stay two, and I don't want to run my engine with an alternator at idle to recharge my batteries. And I can't add more batteries on my boat because I don't have the space for it, or I don't want, to, I don't want the weight, or I don't want to spend the money on batteries, right? Could be multiple reasons. So they're going to say, okay, perfect. Or they might be what some of my boaters are doing. <clears throat> we did a large catamaran, like myself. I don't have a large catamaran, but I said, but I said, okay, you know what? Of course. I went, sold it. I'm like, we're going to offset all amp hours. Our solar array, four months of the year, I don't need to plug in. If I don't want to plug in, I'm actually going to be, what is my daily amp hour consumption on my boat? It's one, about 108, 110. I'm like, I'm going to have an array that will meet my daily consumption. And in the summer, I never have to run my alternator, never have to connect to shore power. I could stay at the hook four months of the year. That's done. So people that are going offshore, for example, that catamaran, we did a 1400 watt array. Why? Because they want to be off-grid, never plug in again, and 1,400 watts, that's basically going to give them, and we'll talk about the math, about 300 amp hours a day of power. That's it. They're, they're self-sufficient. They're off-grid forever. Their batteries are going to be cycling at night, but in the daytime, they're going to completely catch up, and they're able to stay two days at anchor without even worrying about sun. And if it happens, then they can run their alternators, but they won't need to, right? You got lots of mounting options. We got flexible solar panels, which we sew onto canvas and, and we even glue onto hardtops. You can actually peel and stick solar panels. Like I even mount solar panels on the deck you can walk on. So we did that on a sailboat just recently. Um, and then basically on a rigid, we do a lot of solar panels on arches. Right, I'm doing a 44 foot sailboat. We're doing a bunch of solar panels. The Catalina 50 that we're also doing, that's also having an arch. We're doing solar panels on that. Or you can install like tubing, stainless steel tubing. The challenge is with rigid is that it makes, you know, or let's rephrase. The advantage with flexible solar panels is that they can follow the curvature of your boat. And that is important to some of us, right? Some people like, I had a power boater tell me, he has a, a power boat, he says, I don't want a solar panel that looks like a solar panel. I don't want a line, a straight line on my boat. I'll do solar, but only if it follows the curve of my boat. And that would be a good advantage of doing flexible because you'll actually make it follow the canvas. Nobody knows it's there, right? The, just the curvature, the profile of your boat looks the same. As Soon as you put rigid, ultimately you're gonna have straight lines. Some people are not burdened by aesthetics as much as others. And for them, that's a huge advantage because a rigid solar panel is generally at least half the price of a flexible, right? A flexible solar panel is about the thickness of a dime, right? It's about the tenth of the weight, but it's about at least double the, at least double the price, at least. So, you know, it depends on budget, it depends on aesthetics, but there's a lot of choice. So, if you've decided that you're going to do solar, this is actually a really cool takeaway. 
And what it tells you is that ultimately there's a long version of a formula, but the short version of the formula, which gives you the same result, is if you're actually wanting, you're wondering how much is a 100 watt solar panel going to give me in amp hours, right? Like, what's going to be my daily output in amp hours? You, if you want to be realistic, right? Not optimistic, not conservative, but kind of like on average, what is a 100 watt solar panel going to give me? It's going to give you 25 amp hours in this latitude in the summer months. Obviously not in winter, but in the summer months between May to August, you're looking at about a factor of four. Another way to look at it is you could say, Jeff, I want 100 amp hours of daily output from solar. How big should my array be? Well, you do 100 amp hours times four, it gives you 400 watts. And then you can do that 400 watt panel in mono or poly. Obviously, a poly 400 watt array is going to be bigger than a 400 watt mono array. Okay? But that's how the calculation happens. We're actually lucky in the Pacific Northwest. And if you read blogs, this won't make sense to them. Because in the Caribbean, the sunlight is, even in the summer months, only about 12, 13 hours. In the Pacific Northwest, in the winter, we don't have 12, 13 hours. It's much less than that. But in the summer months, we get 16, 17 hours. That longer sunlight makes for better output. Not at any given moment, but over time. That's why in the summer months, in the Pacific Northwest, at this latitude, we're actually able to get more output from our solar panels than people would in the Caribbean. Not many people boat in the winter here, so it's not like... A lot of naysayers will say, well, solar panels are useless in the wintertime. I'm like, oh yeah? Have you seen how empty the anchorages are? Last weekend, probably one of the most gorgeous weekends, like this weekend, I was in the Gulf Islands. Wallace is, got no boat on Monday. Um, no, and this was a long weekend. Pyrus Cove is empty. Montague is completely empty. There's not a single boat. No boat in Ganges that are coming in and out. Nobody's boating. So nobody boats in the winter except a few crazy people, myself included. So for the most part, I would say solar is great because most of us boat in the summer. And that's when you need solar, when you're boating. Not in the winter when you're connected to shore power. So a large different selection of solar panels. This is only like in our shop, we probably have 60 different sizes of solar panels. So it's a way to, every, they all come in different shapes. Well, not shapes, they're all rectangular, but different lengths and widths. And that's how you can cover the surface area on a boat. And originally the same thing, there's a lot of choice. So to recap, you do the shorthand formula, wattage divided by times four equals your daily amp hour. Make sure, uh, these are lots of selection in rigid and popular flexible, Gioco, Solera, which are really German, they're really good too, they're walk-on. Think about what's the difference between mono and poly, right, if you're gonna go best value or more efficient. Those are probably the selection criterias. You really get with solar, by the way, you get what you pay for with solar. You really do. So here's a little slide I decided to throw in there. I was thinking about this because I get this question all the time. <clears throat> and based on um, feedback from YouTube, I had uh, a boater that was commenting, oh, you know what? This is so stupid. Why do you say MPPT all the time? Look at this guy, he's saying PWM is better. And I was like, oh God. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. If you've got a solar array made of solar panels that are very inexpensive, rigid, poly, and you're doing a huge array, loss of efficiency won't matter to you so much. Because, I mean, how big is your house or your roof? I mean, it's limit, almost limitless. On a boat, the challenge is, it's very hard to find a good location to mount a solar panel. It's going to be hard. More, more reasons than not, you won't be able to do everything you want to do with solar. And if you spend money on flexible solar panels, which are some of them are up to five, six times the price of a rigid panel on the high-end quality ones, my argument is that it doesn't make sense to buy a PWM controller, pulse width modulation, and lose 20% of that array when you can lose only about 3% with an MPPT controller. So the takeaway here is that if you end up buying expensive panels per watt, for whatever reason, quality, 
um, you know, it's the only ones that could fit, you want to walk on, whatever. If you end up buying expensive panels, it doesn't make sense to buy a PWM controller and to lose 20% of that array when you can lose only maybe 3% of the array if you went with an MPPT. The other big advantage with MPPT, especially with power boats or boats that I don't, we don't experience shading, is we'll put the panels in series. And in series, the voltage can start adding. Like you might have one solar panel, 20 volts, another one panel, 20 volts, another panel, 20, 20. So now we have 80 volts coming in. PWMs will only allow to about 18 volts in on average, most controllers. The MPPT will allow up to, and I'll show you, some of them actually have up to 100 volts coming in, right? DC. And then they convert that 100 volts DC to whatever battery voltage you have. Your battery voltage could be 12 volts, or it actually could be 24 volts. So here's an example. 75 in, 15 amp, maximum ampacity to the panel. The maximum ampacity generally is going to be, because most of the time we're actually downgrading the voltage, is generally going to be the battery side. But if you were having a boost controller, the boost controller would actually have higher amperage on the input and then lower amperage on the out. So what do you want to look for when you're getting controllers? Well, first of all, make sure you buy a controller that's for your battery voltage. Sounds silly, but not all of us have 12 volts. Some of us have 24. Some boats even have 32 volts. So make sure the output is matched to your battery voltage. People that do hybrid, um, you know, like engines with 48, 48 volt batteries, you want a 48 volt battery controller. Make sure that the controller can handle the amperage and the voltage from the array is really important. And that you can also customize it to fit the battery profile because you can actually tailor, you can say, I want a controller with a Firefly profile. I want a controller that does AGM. And so make sure that if you're gonna buy a controller and if you have not flooded batteries, that you can actually choose the charge profile. That really makes a difference. So here's an example, this is interesting. We've got a lot of solar panels that are less than 10 volts. You're thinking, well, why would I buy a less than 10 volt solar panel? A watt is a watt, right? It doesn't matter if it's 100 amps at one watt, right? Or 10 amps at 10 watts. Like its power is volt times amps. So some solar panels, the way they're done is they're 100 watts, 115 watts, but the output is actually less than 12 volts. So you need what's called a boost controller, bring the voltage up to what your batteries need. Okay, I get owners that sometimes are stubborn, don't believe me, <clears throat> and they're like, ah, oh, it's BS, you're just making this, this stuff up. And then they end up buying the solar panels, they use their controllers, and oddly enough, completely out of the blue, it doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, well there you go, full loop. Now let's put, can we put the boost controllers in now? Oh, so it really is, yeah, I'm like, that's why it's, I didn't invent the product. There's a reason, like you really need to think about what is your solar array gonna be. So basically that's kind of a recap on a little bit solar panels here. Um, again, just to put it into context. Does anybody have any questions on solar for their boat? Why would you, under what circumstances would you go to parallel in series rather than single? Okay, yeah, I didn't bring that, that question. That's a good question. Question is, why would you choose to wire your panels in parallel or in series or dedicated controller? A few reasons. First might be in a situation where you have no shading possibility, right? So not a sailboat, because sailboats have lots of shade. Powerboat, flybridge, no radar arch much higher, or if the radar arch, it's really back. You know, they, maybe they have a radar tower and it's way back. Right, so the Bimini is completely empty of any shading potential. Putting the panels in series makes good sense there. Because A, we're gonna save on the wiring and the install, because I could start actually having the series jumper, and instead of coming back all the way down to near the battery where this is gonna be mounted, those wires, I only have to have a pair of wires coming down. And two wires are actually gonna be able to handle maybe two panels, three panels, four panels. The voltage goes up as I put things in series. Think about a golf cart battery. You buy a golf cart battery at six volts, you put two in series, the amp hour stays the same, but the voltage went up to 12 volts. Or for some boaters have 30, 24 volts, so you put four golf carts in series. It's still always a 220 amp hour battery, but it's 220 amp hours now at 24 volts, right? 
So here the voltage would increase, but the amperage stays the same. So you, you're not increasing the wire sizes, it need to be bigger. And then you need a controller, and here is a 100 volt controller that can take up to 30 amps. So that would be a reason. On boats that have a lot of shading, you want each panel, you don't want one panel to bring down other panels. Now, good panels will also have what are called diodes, bypass diodes, so if one is really shaded, it's not gonna take down the whole array. But still, be, that being said, when we were doing sailboats or biminis, for example, on a Dodger on bi, both sides of a mass on a sailboat, we've got a port and starboard solar panel on a Dodger, we're gonna end up doing a controller per panel. But then we'll have two wires on each side coming down. And two wires, why? Because two wires, because it's a circuit, right? With electricity, you need a one wire in, one wire up. Otherwise, it's not connectivity. And you know what's really confusing? And I was thinking about it the other day. I was trying to explain to someone. I'm like, I think what's confusing is that at home, we have a cord. And we call that a cable, right? And when you plug into something, you just plug in one. What you say, you say, we call it colloquially a wire. But it actually is a cable. And what is a cable? A cable is actually made of multiple wires. Right? You plug that in, there's actually three wires in that plug. So that's why it's kind of misleading. It's only one cable, but that one cable has three wires in it. With DC, you need two. And they're generally not a duplex. They're generally separate. So that's why it's sometimes confusing. So for shading areas, we do controller, dedicated controllers. And for non-shading, we do series. But at one point, you have to ask yourself, and I do stop at one point when the panel voltage is too high, nobody expects DC volts to be that dangerous. Right? You touch a 12-volt battery with your hands, you're not going to get electrocuted, right? There's not enough potential to go through your body. But if you have a solar panel that's outputting 100 or 120 volts DC, and you're out there being the MacGyver, and you're down below thinking everything's fine, 120 volts at DC is going to hurt. So at one point, I start making a threshold. And I'm like, well, you know what? I know it works, but nobody on a boat expects 100 volts DC. So I'm like, we're going to put two controllers, one port, one starboard. And the reason you got to think about this, too, is that controllers are not one controller size for everything. If you're going to have a controller that's going to be able to hand four panels, it's not going to be four times the price of a little one, but it might be three times. So it's not like one controller does everything because you need a controller that can handle either the input voltage or the input amps, right? And as they get more, the voltage gets higher, that controller is more money. So there's not a magical controller that does everything. You're sizing the controller per array. So there's no real cost, in, true cost incentive to go one controller for everything. And the other reason too is for people that go offshore, if you have one controller that does everything, if you lose that one controller, you lose everything. It's called a single point of failure. Again, engineer, I'm like, I don't like single point of failures, right? I'm like, I like to have redundancy, right? I geek out. So if I lose one, I lose just one panel. And that's why in boats that are going offshore that really need their solar array, then I'm probably gonna end up putting more controllers to limit single point of failures. Other questions? Yeah? Why do you need the controller closer to the battery? Yeah, that's a... Why do you need a controller closer to the battery? Some controllers actually are temperature compensating with some, not all, inside the unit. They want the ambient temperature. Not all of them. And some of them also have leads to go to there for temperature compensating. Like on my boat, my controllers aren't temperature compensated, so my controllers actually went, what I ended up doing is I went, four solar panels are coming at the aft of the boat, and then I have four controllers literally on the aft bulkhead, aggregated to one pair of cable that goes to the batteries. So I'm trying with these slides to go with what's the most common rule. There's most times exceptions to all those rules. Yes? Is there a, so Short of maybe keeping the system under 50 volts for safety, is there a sweet spot for solar panel voltage? Like you could have it all the way, you could have a boost controller and have low voltage panels or uh, a step down. I, yeah, the, yeah, your question is valid. I think it's really good. I mean, 
what's, there is no sweet, sweet spot. I think other than electrocution from just, because people think 12 volts is benign, even 24, realistically, other than a dead short, but you're not gonna be humanly, if you touch a 24 volt battery with your hands on the positive negative post, you're not gonna be electrocuted. There's not enough potential there. Other than that, it doesn't matter if it's lower, because we'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Power is V equals I. So if you bring V down, I is directionally just simply higher. So you could have 100 watts, one volt times 100, or you could have 100 volts times one amp. It's the same thing, power is power, right? Other than wire size. Wire size, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Connectors. Yeah, connectors have to be, so funny, I deleted that. I was like, we gotta go forward, <laughs> comes back. <laughs> So MC4 connectors are essential with solar panels. You absolutely need to use these waterproof connectors. Um, they're actually the ability to be done and redone. Um, there's, it's black and white. There's no reason not to. You just need a special crimper to do the ends. That's the only thing. You can improvise, of course. MacGyver does everything under duress. But to do it right, you need a special crimper to do the ends. They're not that expensive. Like when we did solar, we started solar. I did solar on my boat six years ago, and now we're full in. Like, like we do solar like crazy. Like it's, it's a big part of our business. Every one of my technicians has solar crimpers. And we have solar crimpers at the office because people say, I don't have them. Can you do cables for me because I'm going to be interconnecting and I don't have them? So we have the crimpers, and it's called MC4. It's the standard, and it allows, it's actually waterproof, and you can do them outside. You can actually undo and redo. Because some people are removing their solar panels and then reinstalling them on the canvas. They'll take them off and they'll put them back on again. So you can do that. Did you put yours in six years ago as, a, as the technology changed? Much? No, not at all. Actually, this panel's a good question. Has, that's a fear, right? I'm spending money today, but tomorrow it's gonna be so much better, so I'm not gonna spend any money. I put on my boats, solar panels on my boat, literally six years ago. They are selling that solar panel today and still to this day, because obviously I'm inclined to do things right the first time, are still the best solar panels you can buy. And I still have incredible output. Like I measure my output of my solar panels because I geek out and I use it to justify to my partner why we did this huge investment in time and money, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, have you seen how amazing this output is? Isn't it incredible? justifying the purchase, right? It's a really, it's a great way for, you know, to help other purchases in the future. And so I think it's really a good idea to go with quality. And honestly, there is, people always talk, oh yeah, look at what the University of Austin did. I'm like, do you know how long it takes to bring something to market in this? Like, it's just poly or mono, that's it, there's nothing. The only big innovation is that there is ridiculous flexible solar panels that you can buy at Canadian Tire. Those are ridiculous. I mean, it's the panel's this big, it gives you like 10, 10 watts. Those are a joke. Our real solar panel is totally, and there's China makes them, they're, they're made everywhere. The best ones in flexible, no doubt, are from Germany and Italy. They make the best. And then basically China copies them and makes replication of them for about half the price or less, depending on the quality of the manufacturer. Yeah, the, uh, the question was, what about the surface of the panel? Um, I like the smooth one um, because I don't walk on mine. They're on top of a Bimini and a, and a Dodger. I never actually have washed my solar panels with any detergent, anything, because it's so perfectly smooth, and I've made sure that I don't wash them with a rag or anything or a rag. I'm not scratching the surface, that even bird droppings don't hold on to the panel. There's bird droppings on my boat everywhere. Drives us crazy, the canvas, the deck, the solar panels. It, there's nothing to adhere to. It's such a smooth epoxy surface that it dries and it just probably blows away. Like there's nothing to hold on to because the, this panel is perfectly smooth. So now the ones that you walk on, you have to. There's no choice, otherwise you'd slip. So the ones that are from Solera, uh, the German one, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be like, it looks like an anti-skid, right? But they're also big money. Like, I mean, this is not, this is, this is the real deal. Like, this is not a cheap panel. Like, if you're buying something from Germany, 
like cheap and German don't probably go together that much, right? So you need to have the budget and you know what you're buying. Like I have very few people that come to us and say, I want a solar panel and then they end up getting a Solera. They come to us and say, they've done all of their research and like, I want Solera. I'm like, great decision. I agree. Yeah, here's why. But I'm not going to convert someone looking at a Chinese panel that's looking at 300 watt, $300 and he's going to buy an $1,800 panel. Like it's never going to happen. Like it's, they're just not going to convert. Okay, I'm going to let go solar panels uh, for the purpose of time, but feel free to ask me more questions on solars. I'm pretty passionate about it because it actually is a real thing and it gives real results.